Okay, um, good afternoon. I'm Ed Bechtel from Bechtel's Pharmacy. We're here again at the Slangton Public Library uh, to do our monthly diabetes lecture, The Sweet Spot. There are so many different facets of diabetes and lots of different terms that you hear. Today, let's talk about some of the most common ABCs of diabetes and define them together. We'll start with a review of our basic sweet spot truths. Most of us know that there are two main types of diabetes, um, with some exceptions. Most diabetics fall into either the categories of type 1 or type 2. Um, type 1, your body doesn't make insulin. Type 2, your body makes insulin but doesn't use it properly. Um, if you're not sure what you have, you can ask your doctor. Many times we can also tell based on the medications you take. Remember, neither type of diabetes is worse than the other. You may get diabetes in different ways, but the complications from diabetes um, are the same no matter which way you get it. So what should your blood sugar be? Um, your fasting blood sugar before you eat anything in the morning should be between 80 and 130. Um, after you eat an hour, your postprandial blood sugar, uh, an hour or two after you eat, it should be no higher than 180. We control diabetes using a, a three-pronged approach, the three-legged stool approach. Um, the three legs stand for healthy eating, exercise, and medications. Um, each of those is as, important, is as important as the other. And you'll notice that two of those three are totally under your control, and the third one, taking your medications, um, is pretty much under your control too. So, so we're going to go through the alphabet. <laughs> A is for A1C. One of the most common terms associated with diabetes is A1C. This is a blood test that measures a person's average blood glucose level over the previous two to three months. The average lifespan of a red blood cell is about three months. Um, when your sugar goes up, sugar attaches to the red blood cell and then it doesn't let go. So even if you get desirable fasting blood sugars in the morning, if your postprandial blood sugars are going too high, that sugar is going to attach to the red blood cells cells, and that's going to show up on the hemoglobin A1C. There's no cheating this test. You can't, you know, you can't eat well a day or two before you go and have it come back good, where eh, sometimes you can do that with a, a fasting blood sugar and maybe watch for a few days before you go to the doctor and, and get a good fasting blood sugar, but you can't cheat the A1C. Um, this test is also known as the hemoglobin A1C because hemoglobin is the part of the red blood cell that carries oxygen. Sometimes hemoglobin joins with glucose in the bloodstream. The A1C test shows the amount of glucose that sticks to the red blood cells, which allows us to determine the amount of glucose, the average amount of glucose in the blood. B is for beta cells. Beta cells are the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. These cells um, this is a very normal natural process and sometimes it's disrupted for one reason or another. When the beta cells in the pancreas don't secrete any or enough insulin, that's when diabetes develops. In type 1 diabetes, the beta cells aren't producing any insulin at all. For some reason, those cells are destroyed. In type 2, you're not producing enough insulin to accommodate for the amount of sugar that's in your bloodstream. C is for carb counting. Carbohydrate counting is a meal planning method. It's been proven to be very successful for patients living with diabetes. The suggested amount of carbohydrate you can, should consume can vary based on your activity level. A good starting point is about 45 to 60 grams of carb, carbohydrate per meal. Speak with your healthcare provider for more information. It makes me crazy when people come to me and they say, 
you know, I went to the doctor, I was diagnosed as having type 2 diabetes, and all my doctor told me was to avoid carbohydrates. Well, you need some carbohydrates in your diet. Totally cutting carbohydrates out is, that's not good for you, and it's not sustainable. It's not healthy. So, when the doctor tells you to avoid carbohydrates, that's probably not good advice. Cutting, you know, cutting back on processed carbohydrates is probably a good idea. You know, is, there a, is there a list of processed carbohydrates, you know, that we know exactly what it is? Well, I mean, if you're eating whole grain, um, you know, whole grain carbs as opposed as opposed to processed, so so whole wheat flour as opposed to white flour, um, brown rice as opposed to white rice, whole grain breads as opposed to white bread. Well, wouldn't it be, you mean, like to look up? Yes. Is there a... Yes. The book. Oh, the, the Calorie King? Yeah. There's books that you look up potato chips, <clears throat> even the brand, and it'll tell you how many ounces and then carbs, the calories, I forget what else. Fat. Fat. I mean, mm -hmm. they're all listed. Yeah. yeah. I think but I might. Reading, reading labels, if, if things, um, you know, if you see that it has um, like a, bag of a good amount of, yeah. you know, a good amount of fiber in it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm trying to remember the, I think it's three to five grams per serving um, is good and nine is great. I forget what the, I forget the numbers. But you, you know, the, the more grams of fiber there are per serving, right. you know, that probably means it has more whole grains. I mean, fruit, fruit is fruit is good. I mean, it goes kind of goes to that glycemic index we talked about a few months ago. The more you process things, the higher they're going to be on that glycemic index, which means that they're going to, you know, the sugar gets into the bloodstream faster and raises your blood sugar faster. So, yeah, whole grains are are better than you know things that are more processed. <laughs> D is for diabetic ketoacidosis, um, or DKA. This is an emergency medical condition where extremely high blood glucose levels, along with a severe lack of insulin, results in a breakdown of fat for energy and, accumul and an accumulation of ketones in the blood or urine. Uh, signs of diabetic ketoacidosis can include nausea and vomiting, stomach pain, a fruity breath odor, and rapid breathing. Uh, regular monitoring of blood glucose levels is a big part of diabetes management. Don't hesitate to talk to your pharmacist or doctor about checking your blood glucose levels. And when your blood glucose is high, then there are, there are urine tests that you can do for ketones, and if you have ketones in in your urine, um, that could could be a medical emergency. E is for edema. Um, fairly common occurrence in patients with diabetes. Edema is another word for swelling caused by excessive fluid in the body. Edema typically occurs in the extremities and with the legs and feet being a particular frequency. If you're experiencing edema, talk to your doctor or pharmacist to find out what might be causing it. Um, that fluid buildup can be a sign of uh, heart disease, congestive heart failure, um, it can be a sign of kidney disease, both of which are more common in patients with diabetes. F is for foot care. It may sound like a simple thing, but it's incredibly important in individuals with diabetes. Often diabetes can cause damage to the nerve endings in the feet and toes, making you less aware of injuries. Perhaps it's only a small scrape from a rock or you stepped on a small staple, but left untreated it can become infected and grow into something much worse. 
Here are a few simple steps to help you make sure your feet stay healthy. One, wash and dry your feet daily using mild soap and warm water. Pat the skin dry instead of rubbing and apply lotion to your feet to prevent cracking. Don't apply lotion between your toes. That can lead to, to fungus in, in between the toes. Examine your feet. Look for dry, cracked skin, blisters, cuts, scratches, and other sores. Also check for redness or tenderness or for ingrown toenails and calluses. If you get a blister or so, sore, don't pop it. Cover the area with a bandage and wear a different pair of shoes. Three, cut your toenails after bathing when they're soft. Cut straight across and smooth the edges with a nail file. Avoid cutting into the corners of the toes and cutting into the cuticles. Four, protect your feet by wearing comfortable, appropriate socks and shoes. They make special socks for uh, diabetic patients that have uh, neuropathy that don't have seams in them. So it, it reduces that um, chance of pressure points in it rubbing. Um, they also make special shoes for people that have uh, neuropathy, so that, you know, for diabetics. So. Um, choose natural fiber socks such as cotton wool or a cotton wool blend, blend and change them daily. Wear shoes that will protect your feet from various weather conditions such as moisture and cold temperatures. Also make sure your shoes fit properly. Um, some pharmacies carry special shoes that your doctor may recommend. Do you carry them? We don't. Um, at one point we were trying to get uh, accredited to do that, but uh, we never got, <laughs> never got approved. But uh, Hearts was in Caddy. That's where I usually send people. And you have a prescription or something for that? Or? Um, to get them covered under Medicare, the, yeah, you have to you have to be diagnosed with diabetes, and you have to. I mean, there's criteria that you would have to meet. Yeah. But Medicare does cover. Them. Mm -hmm. The doctor has to write, right? What's that? Doesn't the doctor have doctor to write? Doctor has to wear them. Yeah. yeah. G is for glucose urea. Um, glucose urea is glucose in the urine. Um, ordinarily, the urine contains no glucose because the kidneys are able to reclaim the filtered glucose back into the bloodstream. The presence of glucose in the urine is usually caused by elevated blood glucose levels. That 180, that it shouldn't go over, at 180 milligrams per deciliter, the kidneys start to recognize that your glucose is too high and it tries to get rid of it. By, by filtering out. So that's when you start seeing um, sugar in the urine. And up until, you know, the, well, it's probably 20 years now that um, we have inexpensive blood glucose monitoring devices. Um, before that, they, that's the way they used to, you know, people used to you know, use dipsticks in their urine to see if there was sugar in their urine and then estimate from there what, what their blood sugar was. Now, you know, technology is advanced and we can do a much better job of tracking our blood levels. Um, glucose urea also leads to excessive water loss in the urine, which can result in dehydration. Now, there are a couple of newer drugs that actually work in the kidney to take glucose out of the bloodstream. So there are some people you know, with type 2 diabetes, after you've failed on a couple other drugs or if other drugs aren't adequately controlling your blood sugar, the doctor will prescribe drugs that actually cause glucosuria, um, cause the kidney to take the, the uh, sugar out of your bloodstream. But it's important if you're on one of those drugs that you drink plenty of fluids because you can't become dehydrated. And there's no way to take them the sugar out of the bloodstream without taking some water with it. H. 
such an important letter they gave it to. <laughs> um, hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, two of the most common terms associated with diabetes. Hyper, meaning high, is a condition of excessive elevated blood glucose. This can lead to diabetic ketoacidosis, as we discussed earlier. The opposite, hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar, is also a serious condition. When blood glucose levels fall too low, usually below 70 milligrams per deciliter, you may become hungry, nervous, shaky, dizzy, confused, or sleepy. If this occurs, you want to consume carbohydrate-rich foods such as juice, soda, not diet soda, or a glucose tablet or gel. If very severe, you can also use injectable glucose in the form of a glucagon pen. Our bodies do need some level of glucose to function properly, so levels that are too high or too low are both dangerous. I is for impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance. Um, impaired fasting glucose is a condition in which a blood glucose test taken after an 8 to 12 hour fast shows a level of glucose higher than normal but not high enough to diagnose diabetes. It's pre-diabetes. Yeah. The situation is also referred to as prediabetes and is diagnosed when the blood glucose level of 100 to 125 milligram, milligrams per deciliter. If your doctor has told you that you have prediabetes or impaired fasting glucose, this is an opportunity to make some simple lifestyle changes and help prevent the development of diabetes. Um, you know, if you know somebody who has prediabetes, um, I do do uh, a lifestyle class that helps people to lose weight and they've found that if you can lose 5 to 10 percent of your starting weight if you're pre-diabetic that it can reduce your risk of developing type 2 diabetes by over 50 percent for most people and if you're over 60 uh, and you do that, it can reduce it by over 70%. So, if you're interested in that, talk to me later. J is for juvenile diabetes. Um, a term we don't use much anymore. Um, we call it type 1 diabetes now. but many elderly patients still refer to type 1 diabetes using this term. Many patients living with type 1 diabetes were diagnosed as children, and the term recognized that fact. Type 2 diabetes is more common, although huge strides are being made every year to address both types of diabetes. K is for kidneys may seem strange to talk about kidney health with diabetes, but we know that diabetes can often damage the small blood vessels in our bodies. The kidneys are comprised of millions of tiny blood vessels that act as filters. These filters remove waste products from the blood. Diabetes can damage these vessels, causing their filtering system to break down and the kidneys to fail. Failing kidneys lose their ability to filter out waste products, resulting in kidney damage or nephropathy. How can we prevent kidney disease? Not everyone with diabetes develops kidney disease, and there are factors that can influence kidney disease development. These include genetics, blood sugar control, and blood pressure control. The more we keep diabetes and blood pressure regulated, the lower the chances are of developing kidney disease. L is for long-acting insulin. The type of insulin that starts to lower blood glucose within four to six hours after an injection and has its stronger, strongest effect 10 to 18 hours after injection. These insulins are typically given once a day um, examples include Lantus and Levomir. 
There are also short-acting or rapid-acting insulin, such as Novolog, Humalog, or Epidra, that are typically given before meals. These insulins start to work right away and are used to assist with covering the food, the carbohydrates um, eaten in the meal. I guess S is not for short acting. <laughs> <laughs> M is for metabolic syndrome. Um, metabolic syndrome is the tendency of several conditions to occur together. Um, high blood sugar, high LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, large wastes, um, those are all things that kind of go together and, and make up metabolic syndrome. I also call it couch potato syndrome because, you know, it's, uh, it's related to lifestyle. So, these conditions occur together, include obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes or pre-diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. Metabolic syndrome is a risk factor for many health issues, including cardiovascular disease and stroke. Managing each individual factor and creating a healthy lifestyle are critical for decreasing the risks associated with metabolic syndrome. And as for neuropathy, neuropathy is a disease of the nervous system. In diabetes, neuropathy results because chronically elevated blood glucose damages the tiny blood vessels in the nerve endings. There are three major forms of neuropathy associated with diabetes. Peripheral neuropathy, which is what most of us think about when we think about neuropathy. You know, we all probably know somebody that has diabetes, that has neuropathy, where they have tingling, numbness, um, loss of feeling, and you know, their fingers or their toes, their feet. Um, autonomic neuropathy. Um, the autonomic nervous system is what controls like our involuntary function. So when you get the damage in those nerves, um, you know, it can be, can cause things like um, delayed emptying of the stomach or uh, loss of that uh, the reflex that you, when you when your blood sugar drops, you get shaky. Um, you can lose that when, when you have autonomic neuropathy. Uh, and mononeuropathy, which is just one, one nerve is, is affected. The most common form of neuropathy is peripheral neuropathy, which affects mainly the legs and the feet, is characterized by burning or tingling. Commonly prescribed medications for peripheral neuropathy are Neurontin, Gabapentin, and Lyrica. I was for obesity. Obesity is often discussed in conjunction with diabetes because the risk associated with being obese and developing diabetes. Being obese, obese or overweight does not cause diabetes, but it is associated with an unhealthy lifestyle, excess sugar consumption, consumption, lack of exercise, and many other health concerns, including metabolic syndrome, which we just discussed. One simple way to reduce your risk and start an exercise routine is to simply start walking. Walking is a great aerobic activity that can be done anywhere and by anyone. P is for physical activity. Physical activity is another important factor of diabetes management. Regular aerobic activity has many wonderful health benefits, including achieving and maintaining a healthy weight, heart health, increased energy, better sleep, and less stress. Some simple ways to get started include walking, water aerobics if you have joint problems, group activities such as basketball, softball, or tennis, and even yard work and cleaning can be aerobic. Just make sure to get your pulse up. You want to aim for 30 minutes a day most days of the week. If you need a break, 
If you need to break that up into two or three 10 to 15 minute sessions, that's okay too. Q is for questions. Whether you've just been diagnosed or you've been living with diabetes for your entire life, you will always have questions. Don't hesitate to talk to your doctor or pharmacist about any health questions you have. The only dumb questions are the ones that aren't asked. R is for retinopathy. Another complication of diabetes is retinopathy. Retinopathy is an eye disease caused by damage to the small blood vessels in the retina. The retina is the light sensitive layer of tissue that lines the back of the eye. When severe or left untreated, retinopathy may result in blindness. This is why your doctor recommends routine eye exams with a specialist and another reason that blood glucose control is so very important. S is for stress. Managing stress is important for everyone, but stress can have specific negative effects when it comes to diabetes. Excessive stress works against diabetes management by increasing blood glucose levels quickly and substantially, including strong negative emotions, impairing sound thinking and decision making, and promoting compulsive poor eating and decisions. Furthermore, prolonged stress also has a negative impact on other bodily systems such as the immune system, digestive, renal, and reproductive systems. While everyone's approach to fighting off stress will be different, here are a few ideas. Start an exercise program, join a sports team, take dance lessons, or join a dancing club. Start a new hobby or learn a new craft. Volunteer at a hospital or for a charity. Try to intentionally relax using breathing exercises or progressive relaxation. You can also reduce stress and promote relaxation through exercise or simply replacing bad thoughts with good ones. Yoga. Yoga is a good, another good uh, way to uh, address stress. T is for treatment options. While diabetes is definitely a condition that you want to take seriously, don't forget that it can be managed and controlled. Everyone with diabetes can benefit from lifestyle modifications, and most people also use a combination of medications to keep their diabetes under control. This could be in the form of oral tablets or injections, including insulin. Being diagnosed with diabetes doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have to take insulin or use other injections. There are multiple options available to you. Especially, well, if you're type two. If you're type one, you're gonna need insulin injections. Um, talk to your pharmacist or your doctor about which plan is right for you. U is for uncontrolled diabetes. One term that's heard quite often in the diabetes world is uncontrolled. Uncontrolled diabetes is very dangerous and can lead to damage of major organs like we previously discussed. Uncontrolled diabetes can lead to blindness and amputation as the tiny blood vessels in the eyes and the extremities are damaged by extremely high blood glucose levels. Again, diabetes is definitely something to take seriously. But with so many options available, your doctor and pharmacist can help you bring your diabetes under control. Why did they pick 100? What? Constant blood sugar level of over 100. Fasting. If you're fasting, blood sugar is... But now, now if you remember from the slide earlier, the, and it varies between whose guidelines you're following, but the American Diabetes Association recommends, will we'll recognize this 125 or below as being controlled. Um, the American Academy of Endocrinologists says 130. So the slide that we showed showed that 130. And then you want your A1, A1C 
to be seven or below. B is for vitamins. Most people should look for a supplement that contains 100% daily value of each of the following vitamins and minerals. Vitamin A, folic acid, niacin, B1, B2, B6, B12, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, copper, and zinc. Patients with diabetes will want to supplement that um, with 100% daily value for chromium and at least 25% for magnesium. You won't be able to find an option with 100% daily value for magnesium because it won't fit into a single pill. Also, look for the designation stating USP Verified. As, supplement, as these supplements and products have been voluntarily submitted to the United States Pharmacopeia Dietary Supplement Verification Program and have successfully met the program's stringent testing and auditing criteria. The program was established by the USP to help dietary supplement manufacturers ensure production of quality products for consumers. Back in the early 90s, there was a, a law that passed um, that was promoted by the, you know, the, the vitamin and supplement industry to take them out of the jurisdiction of the FDA. So vitamins aren't really regulated by the government per se. The USP is a voluntary organization, um, and it, the, the manufacturers of you know, vitamins and dietary supplements can apply to have their products tested by the USP. So it's you know an extra level of you know quality assurance for you if you find um, vitamins with that USP logo. Not to say that everything that doesn't have the USP logo is bad, but you know it's an extra level of certainty. Wound care it may seem like an odd thing to talk about during a class on diabetes, but proper proper care for wounds is very important. Taking steps to ensure that a wound such as a foot ulcer heals correctly is imperative. We talked about foot care earlier, so let's expand on what to do if you notice cuts, scrapes, or open wounds. First, wash the area with mild soap and warm water, then pat dry. Apply an over-the-counter antibiotic ointment to the wound and cover it with light gauze or a bandage. Note any changes in the area such as increased warmth, tenderness, or redness. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist if the area does not start to heal within a couple of days. X. Yeah, they had a stretch. To get. I was wondering what X was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> had a stretch to get X. No. X is for xylitol, which is a sugar alcohol. Um, it's a non-absorbable sweetener. It's a natural sweetener that's found in berries, fruits, vegetables, and mushrooms. Xylitol is as sweet as regular sugar, contains less carbohydrate than table sugar, and has a glycemic index of 7. Because it's a sugar alcohol, xylitol has less effect on blood glucose than regular sugar. Xylitol is commonly used in toothpaste and chewing gum. Unfortunately, due to digestive issues, high amounts can cause cramping and diarrhea. Why is for yoga? <laughs> An often overlooked option for fitting in some exercise, yoga can stretch and strengthen your muscles. It involves assuming and holding postures that stretch your limbs. Yoga focuses on breathing exercises and uses meditation techniques to calm your mind. Yoga has benefits for both the mind and the body, increasing physical flexibility and reducing internal feelings of stress. Even if you've never tried yoga, there are no weights involved, so it's a great exercise even for beginners. Z is for zebra. Z. You can really stretch for this one. So zebras don't get diabetes. Because zebras eat a healthy 
diet full of natural whole foods and have zero access to processed foods and sodas. They're very physically active, running and walking constantly as part of their daily life. They live in a very low stress environment most of the time. As long as that's is as long as there's no lion around. I was gonna say, unless the lion's chasing them. <laughs> <laughs> Lions aside, all of those components play a vital role in a healthy lifestyle that helps manage diabetes. And our recipe for the meal. Questions?